Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Riley. And good evening, everyone. It's good to be together. I would love it if you had open Joel chapter 3. Uh, if you have a phone, you can easily get your um, Bible on your phone. So, you know, you technologically advanced young people and old people can do that. There's no excuse. It's very helpful to have the Bible in front of you, just so you know, if you're following along what's going on, and so you know that you're here not just to hear me. You're actually here and you're listening on at home. Hello, welcome at home. Uh, you're watching along because this is the Word of God. Um, it's not the Word of Graham. It's the Word of God. That's far more important. Uh, so that's another reason why we should have our Bibles open. So remember to bring your Bible to church. Uh, I, just, I wrote down a note here. Rhiannon, there are two songs I love the most, two types of music. One is when, when there's a whistling solo. That's great. If there's a whistling solo, I'm in, right? Second is there's a hum. There's a hum in that. It was cool. I love it. I love a hum in a song. It reminds me of that, um, uh, well, there's a song called, mm -hmm. and who's that by again? Crash Test Dummies. Crash Test Dummies. There you go. Great song. Anyway, uh, there's an outline as well. That has nothing to do with humming or whistling. Um, follow along on the outline. There are uh, bulletins floating around the room somewhere, so grab one if you need to. And don't forget, if you are away, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. There you go. All right, let's, um, let's pray and we'll have a look at Joel chapter 3, which is a great chapter. We'll see what sense it makes for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're a good God who speaks to us. We pray now over the next 20 or so minutes that you would help us concentrate, help us to see what you have to say to us. And we pray that you'd encourage us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for quite some time, I've followed the Darwin Awards. Has anyone heard of the Darwin Awards? Ah, excellent. Good. Well, you might have seen this one. So the, these are awards, in their words, that commemorate those who improve our gene pool by removing themselves from it in the most spectacular way possible. <laughs> it's about stupid people making stupid decisions and dying for it. Now, look, I had a mixed response with this this morning, I want to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a little bit macabre, okay, but there are some really funny stories, right? I'm going to share one with you in a moment. And yet, look, it, it plays on Darwin's evolutionary theory, right? It's about survival of the fittest and all that. But don't dwell on that, don't go down that road, it's okay. They're just funny stories about stupid people making stupid decisions and dying for it. So I want to share with you one example, and this story is a reminder that decisions matter. 17th of March, 2020, Colorado. Uh, this might take a while, so settle in. Michael Sexton, 58, read of a buried treasure in a book authored by an eccentric and controversial art dealer named Forrest Fenn. Now you can see all this, just Google it, it's a true story. In The Thrill of the Chase, Fenn claims that he himself buried $2 million worth of gold coins and other artefacts somewhere out in the Rocky Mountains. Looks a little like this. And gives clues throughout the book hinting at its secret location in nine poetry verses. Temptation was too great for Michael. Although 350,000 others had gone looking for the buried box, no one is known to have found it. Worse, four men have died in the effort. Unlike the rest of them, however, Michael knew where the treasure was buried based on his interpretation of the clues in the book. So he talked a 65-year-old acquaintance into joining him on the treasure hunt and their quest for quick riches began. In February of 2020, they headed to Dinosaur National Monument, National Park, on the Colorado-Utah border. Michael was so certain he knew where the treasure was that neither he nor his colleague prepared for an overnight stay in the mountains. No doubt assuming that if they started early enough, they would be home by sunset, $2 million richer. Well, Michael was wrong. They found no treasure and they lost their bearings, cold, hungry and disoriented. The future looked grim for Michael and his friend. Shivering and close to death, they were fortunately found just in time by a search and rescue team who brought them down the mountain. One would think that having survived such an experience, Michael would have learned better. But he did not. One month later, 
having sufficiently recovered, he set out for a second try. Once more, he sweet-talked the 65-year-old colleague into joining him because treasure. This time, they would find it. The unfolding COVID-19 epidemic had prom uh, prom prompted intermittent closures of Dinosaur National Monument, and hikers were cautioned that difficult terrain should be avoided so first responders could remain safe in quarantine. But that didn't stop Michael. On Tuesday, March 17th, he left Denver with a few candy bars, two bottles of water, a copy of Fenn's book, and the clothes on his back. Just outside the park, the two men rented snow snowmobiles and loaded them onto the bed of their pickup truck. The bemused rental agent watched the unprepared treasure hunters drive off towards the remote northwest boundary of the park, perhaps wondering how long the unlikely pair would last before they returned. After nightfall, the rental agent alerted the local authorities. The search began. On the morning of Friday the 20th, they found Michael's truck. On Saturday morning, they found the abandoned snowmobiles and saw that Michael and his friend had unwisely continued on foot. Saturday afternoon, they located the two men about a mile from the snowmobiles, ironically, at nearly the exact same spot of the previous rescue a month earlier. Well, Michael was brought back down the mountain, but this time in a body bag. His friend barely survived and refuses to talk about their ordeal to this day. In June 2020, the treasure was rumoured to have been finally discovered, but this word came from the author, Fenn, himself, and he has not provided any further details as to the time of the writing. Fenn's veracity has been questioned by, among others, the FBI, and several lawsuits, only in America, have since been filed against him. Some speculate that the treasure, if it exists at all, consists of artefacts illegally harvested by Fenn. Whatever the truth is, people will no doubt continue looking for this fabled treasure. If so, they had, better, they had best proceed better prepared, or else find themselves in the same sorry predicament as Michael and the treasure trove, buried. That's the story of Michael Sexton. There you go. Now, it could be an illustration for um, greed, couldn't it, really? But it's a bit macabre. They di he died. But that's what happens when you read the Darwin Awards. Uh, friends, decisions matter. Decisions matter, don't they? Uh, bad decisions have consequences. Decisions matter. Today, as we open our Bibles once again, and for the last time in this series of, of the book of Joel, uh, we're reminded that decisions matter, but not just our decisions. In fact, God makes decisions about our decisions. The only thing more important than our decisions is what God decides about them. Now, the people of Joel's day faced the decision whether to heed the prophet's call to remember uh, to repent and return to the Lord. Uh, the other nations faced decisions about how to treat Judah as well as their other neighbours. And their decisions determined how they would fare in the valley of decision. You might remember that phrase from the end of uh, that reading that Rod read out, read out for us. But of course, making no decision, well, that's, that's still a decision, isn't it? When you do nothing you've made a decision. Winston Churchill once said that we build houses and houses build us. And there was an Aussie preacher a while back uh, who argued that we could say the same about decisions. We make decisions, but then our decisions turn around and make us. It's true, isn't it? Well, from our first reading in Matthew 25, Jesus confronts us with a decision about our decisions in every area of life. We are accountable to him for how we live our lives, our material wealth, how we treat the poor and hungry, the stranger. And so Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Every hour we make decisions on whether or not to be to others what Jesus has been to us. And of course, we don't do this alone. Being a Christian is not for hermits. And so God will make decisions about the decisions we have made as part of the church, as, as members of the church. Did we strive to reach more people with the gospel? Or perhaps we just, well, or did we shrink back and just get comfortable? We make decisions. Decisions matter. They affect eternity and they influence others. 
Well, now I think we're ready to grapple with Joel chapter 3. Let's see how Joel chapter 3 has a fair bit to do with decision making. It is an encounter uh, in the metaphorical valley of Jehoshaphat. Isn't that a lovely word to say? Jehoshaphat. Practice it tonight when you get home. Um, See if you can get into some conversation during the week. That'll impress people, won't it? Um, Jehoshaphat is a word play. It's not a place. Uh, It's a word play. It means, uh, you might have heard of the Lord's name uh, Jehovah in the Old Testament, also Yahweh. It means Yahweh judges. So the first half of the word is is, um, Yahweh or, or Jehovah. And the second part of the word is the nation, or sorry, is judges. So he's Yahweh judging the nations, Jehoshaphat. But we know too as individuals and as the church that we cannot, cannot escape the valley's other name. And this is where we read towards the end of the passage, the valley of decision. You see, it's where God decides about our decisions. Well, verse 1, see, begins with, in those days. Uh, what are we talking about here? Well, in those days, the, the, this is the same time frame from last week. Uh, verses th- 28 to 32, this is a time of judgment on the nations. It's that time. Have a look with me the second half of verse 2. The Lord says, There I will put them on trial. And the older NIV has, I will enter into judgment against them. For what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. What do you notice? If you're here last week, what do you notice? You notice the jealousy of God. These, they're, they're possessive pronouns. Pretty sure that's right. Where's my grammar nerds? There's one at the back and there's one over here. Possessive pronouns. There's one over there too, I know. Um, it, it's the jealousy of God. This is, these people are they're, they're, they're God's people. God's treasured possession. Ever since the, just before the Ten Commandments were given, God said to his people, you will be my treasured possession. And he picks it up, uh, the Apostle Peter picks it up again in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, you will be my treasured possession, my, my holy people. He noticed the jealousy of God for what belongs to him. God is jealous for his people and the land that he gave them. You see, the nations have scattered God's people. We'll read about a couple of these nations in a moment. They've scattered God's people and they've divided up the land. And in verse 3, they have abused God's people. So trading boys for prostitutes, common in those times, girls for alcohol, for drink. In verse 4, two of Israel's historical enemies are mentioned. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, they're they're part of the region of the Philistines. We all remember the Philistines. But have a look at verse 4, because you see, they, they, by attacking God's people, they have acted against God. That is not a good place to be, when you have acted against God. And so in verses 9 to 11, this mismatch of being against God is emphasised. It's a bit like the bully in the playground who picks on the little kid only to find out that he's got a very big brother. That's what it is. You're up against a fight, you can't win. You need everything and everybody, but still you, can't, you won't win. Remember, who can endure the day of the Lord? Who can take on God and win? No one. 3 verse 10 contains uh, uh, this reversal of these prophecies from Isaiah 2 verse 4 and Micah 4 verse 3. And there the prophets envisioned a a future time of universal peace when the nations would convert their weapons into farming tools. Now what do we see here in verse 3 verse 10 of Joel? What's the opposite? Here the call to battle, to take on God, good luck, the the call is to encourage the nations to do the opposite of that. In other words, have a look at uh, verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning pruning hooks into spears. Such is their desperation in this uh, battle. You'll need everything and everyone, but still you won't win. Who can endure the day of the Lord? Growing up, there was this um, TV show. uh, Some of you might remember it. It was called Dad's Army. Anyone watch Dad's Army growing up? British, UK, you know, comedy, good fun. Um, 
I, I, I tried to find a relevant clip, but it was a bit hard, to be totally honest. Um, so here's a few of those guys. It was about a group of old, uh, fairly frail men who gave themselves the task to defend England, to defend the home front in World War II. Right? Uh, now, of course, the joke was, is that if it came down to it, these men would make no difference whatsoever. What could they do? They're, they're, they're frail. Um, they'd make barely a difference. They were like, verse 10, the weak pretending to be strong with God. That's what, it's dad's army all over again. That's the nations against God in judgment. That's the point. That's the nations against God in judgment. Dad's army. <laughs> well, in verses 12 to 15, we get this picture of the Lord enthroned as judge to pronounce sentence on the nations. Uh, have a look at verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What do we note there? We see who's in control. Do you see whose decision it is? It's God's decision. This is God's verdict. So what do we make of all this then? What do we make of this? Uh, now, some Christians liken this, and I think they include the rest of Joel as well, some liken this to a, a call, or as a call, to a future holy war for God's people to finally hit back for all the attacks on Christians. What does the Bible? Well, the Bible says that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. If you want to live a faithful life following Jesus, you're going to get some pushback. That's the promise of God. Uh, there will be times when it's tough. See, God's people will always be attacked and put down and mocked because that's what happened to Jesus. And Jesus promises that's what happens to us as we live a godly life. So therefore, this passage, uh, this book, actually should bring us comfort in the knowledge that God will one day judge, and therefore we don't need to. This passage should bring us comfort in the knowledge that there will be justice, and that God is king and enthroned over all, he's sovereign over all, even the enemies of the gospel. And one day, on the day of the Lord... Now, we don't know when that might be. On the day of the Lord, they will meet with the Lord's justice. So this is the verdict, his judgment against his enemies on the day of the Lord, that those who oppose him and bring, that those who oppose him and bring suffering on God's people, this is the verdict. Uh, people such as ISIS, who, who, who went on their bloodied, murderous rampage in, throughout Iraq and parts of the Middle East, uh, targeting Christians, hunting them down, torturing and killing them in, in horrific ways. Or Christian schoolgirls and captured in Nigeria, raped and beaten by Muslim fundamentalists. This passage gives us confidence that God will one day judge, that God will bring justice. There's no need for a holy war because God's war against them does everything that's needed. It, it is natural to want to hit back. I read stories of what, what especially in Nigeria, what's gone on there and, I, I, you know, I want to hit back, uh, to pay back all the wrongs. Now, if God is a God who does not judge, well, sure, then we should take up arms and have a go. We take matters in our own hands, have a holy war. But the fact is God is a God who judges. And we should find comfort in that, that God's got it under control. But ultimately... God will bring justice. It's what Romans 12 says to Paul the Apostle, right at the end, he quotes an Old, Old Testament passage and quotes the Lord, oh, it's mine to avenge. I will repay. Uh, leave room for God's wrath, in other words. It's mine to avenge. I will repay. Friends, the good news of judgment is that God will judge and that he will be a refuge for his people, both now and forever. Now that leads us to these final verses which describe the safety of being in Zion, in Jerusalem. Or as the New Testament describes us, it describes it in Christ, uh, in God's people, God's place. It's worth pausing for a moment, I think, just for a second, and just make sure we're clear on this language. The New Testament teaches us repeatedly that when the Old Testament speaks of Zion or Jerusalem or the people of Israel or the family of Abraham, it is not ultimately speaking about a racial people 
or a political state or a geographical region. It is speaking in historical terms of these things as anticipations of something that which will be fulfilled by a spiritual people who belong to Abraham's family by faith in Christ. So Jew, but also by the grace of God, Gentile as well. So all who are in Christ, using that New Testament language, are in Zion, part of God's people, in God's place. Uh, Romans 4 and Galatians 3 to 4 help with that. You might want to ask another question about that afterwards when we're done. So let's look at these final verses and we'll only just touch on them. Uh, verses 16 to 21, and I've given the heading uh, Restoration and the Knowledge of God. The good news of judgment is that there is a God who judges. And because there is Zion, God's place with God's people living in Christ is the place of safety. Notice in verses 17, and I think we said, I just flipped the page over in my Bible, in verse 21 as well, right at the end, uh, Zion is God's place. The place where God dwells, God's heavenly city, Jerusalem. We, we picked up that language from Revelation 21 and 22 as we look forward to the new heavens and new earth. Heaven, it's a short name for that. It's a safe place. Notice that never again will foreigners invade her. The nations, in other words, outsiders, those who oppose God and his gospel. It's a place where God's people are untouchable by evil or harm. And notice in verse 18 <clears throat> that it's a, it's a rich place. So mountains will drip with new wine. Uh, obviously metaphorical. <laughs> uh, hills flowing with milk. Ravines running with water. God's living water that always satisfies. It should remind us of the conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman sitting by the edge of, the, edge of, the well, edge of this well and uh, and Jesus says, drink this water. He's referring to himself, a relationship with God through Jesus. Drink this water. And he says, you will never be thirsty again. He's not talking about physical water in the well. He's talking about spiritual water that nourishes, that quenches our thirst, our thirst for life, our thirst for understanding this world we live in. You'll never be thirsty again. In Zion... In God's people, in God's place, will never be thirsty again. It's a place where every human longing will be fulfilled and all the pain that we've, we've, we have to go through in this world of longings unfulfilled, of hopes unfulfilled or thirsts and hungers unfulfilled, one day they will be. And if you're in Christ, you can look forward to that day. And I'd say don't be afraid to read this language right now and have our hearts encouraged and warmed by it. Don't be afraid to do that. I want to close with two encouragements. Here's the first. Uh, I, I, I think let's, let's fill our minds with this vision of judgment. Something we probably wouldn't normally say, all right? Fill our minds with this vision of judgment. See, if you are a disciple of Christ... Be comforted that God will bring justice and ultimately that is not our role. The world around us says that you're much better off in the comfort of the nations. It does say that, doesn't it? Your friends at school say that. You're much better off in the comfort of us and not being a Christian. Workplace, wherever, friends. The world around us says you're better off in the comfort of the nations. But the gospel of the Lord Jesus says something very, very different. The gospel says we are only safe in Christ. Second final encouragement, uh, decisions matter. Decisions matter. And we'll only find safety from God's judgment by making the decision to follow that same Lord Jesus. How about I pray? And then we'll see if there's any time for, or see if any, we've got any questions or comments. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that you're a good God who loves us. So much so that you gave your one and only son to die for us. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are safe in your arms as we trust in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, we thank you for the comfort of judgment. That one day uh, you will judge the nations. And Lord God, that there will be, there will be justice. Help us find a comfort in that when times are tough and we see horrific things go on in this world. Um, and Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for church. In Jesus' name, amen.